Welcome to the Saturday History video. Uh, this will be the fourth and last part of a four-part series we've done about the American Revolutionary War around July 4th. Uh, the first one about two weeks ago, they're all available on DickMorris.com if you missed any of them, was about the run-up to, uh, to, to the Declaration of Independence. Then the next one was about the parliamentary maneuvering in passing the Declaration. Then on July 4th, we did one on the reading the Declaration and understanding its philosophical antecedents and what it's based on. And now I'd like to do a discussion of the first year of the Revolutionary War. This discussion is largely based on the book 1776 by David McCullough, which is an excellent, excellent narrative of this first year. It's important to understand how George Washington single-handedly saved this revolution and made it possible for it to succeed in a desperate, desperate gamble at Trenton. But let's work our way up to that. Where we last left the revolution, the British had tried to capture Hancock and Adams and seize munitions at Lexington and Concord and had been massacred in their retreat to Boston. And as a result, they never left the city again. They just stayed bottled up in there because they were terrified of the guerrilla tactics of the Minutemen and the Continental Army. In the meantime, Washington was voted the commander-in-chief by the Continental Congress. And he was only chosen, really, because he was a Virginian. And you had to make clear that this wasn't just a New England revolution. Uh, and Virginia was the other big state. And he had served with some distinction and some criticism as a colonel in the British Army in the uh, Washington, French and Indian War, also called the Seven Years' War in Europe. Washington went north in 1775 and took command of the armies that would be sieging Boston. To call them armies is, is a wild exaggeration. There were a bunch of frontiersmen, none in uniform, uh, no discipline, uh, getting drunk every night, uh, just, just an absolute rabble instead of an army. And Washington had to go through the laborious task of training them and disciplining them. And just when he finished, a lot of their enlistments ran out. They had signed up for three months, and they all went home uh, to planting season to their various farms. And he had to train a whole new bunch of recruits, and it was going very badly. And there was kind of a stalemate. The British wouldn't leave Boston, and Washington couldn't take it. Then Ethan Allen paved the way for a victory here by capturing Fort Ticonderoga on the Hudson River. And the important thing was not the fort, but the guns in the fort. There were, I think, 70 or 80 cannon there. So he captured those, but then how do you get the cannon from, you know, around Lake Champlain in New York State down to Boston, a uh, distance of several hundred miles with no roads? Uh, well, Henry Knox, who was a young uh, colonel, but a young guy uh, in his first military service with Washington, volunteered to go up and get them, and he took an expedition up, and miraculously he brought the cannon back uh, with no loss of life, and I think the loss of only one cannon as an accident on his trip. Well, the cannon changed the whole deal. Washington now had the means to besiege Boston, but he had a problem. If he would implant the cannon in the full view of the British, they'd preemptively attack and he'd be overrun. So what he did was brilliant. Uh, Dorchester Heights that overlooks Boston, in the middle of the night, as soon as sundown happened, he immediately got all of his soldiers to work feverishly throughout the night, building the emplacements for the cannon and putting the cannon in, determined to complete it by the end of the evening. And at first light, the British looked up and there were 80 cannons overshadowing Boston absolute panic in the British High Command. The Navy sailed out to sea because they didn't want anything of land-based cannons that could destroy their ships. And the British in Boston did the only thing they could do, which is to prepare to evacuate. There were some who thought they should attack Dorchester Heights, but after they had lost half their army storming Bunker Hill, uh, they were not prepared to do that again. So the British pulled out. They withdrew from Boston. They retreated. And there was jubilation throughout the colonies. We had actually forced a British army to leave Boston. And there were rumors it's going to the West Indies, going to the United, to back to Britain and everything. But Washington knew what they were doing. They were going to attack New York City, which was the major population center even back then uh, in the colonies. So Washington moved his troops south 
to defend Long Island and New York City. And sure enough, no sooner had he arrived than off the horizon, he saw half the Brit British Navy and the entire British Army aboard those ships. And he prepared for an aggressive, aggressive campaign against him. Well, the British landed on Long Island and they attacked Brooklyn. And they absolutely outmaneuvered the Americans. Some American loyalists showed them a back way around the American defenses. They outflanked them, they surrounded them, and they damn near decimated them. Uh, it was a horrible defeat. Washington saved the day, and I think God had a hand in this too. The British Navy could easily have just sat in the East River and uh, stopped any, uh, any retreat from Long Island to the mainland of the U.S., sort of Manhattan at that point. <laughs> but it was a foggy night, very foggy, incredibly foggy. That's God's part, and Washington's part was that he silently, stealthily brought the whole army over by rowboat from Brooklyn to Manhattan, and then he set up fortifications in Lower Manhattan. Well, a couple of months later, the British followed with another attack, and once again, the American army ran like crazy, uh, didn't offer any kind of a defense. Washington was literally riding among the troops, screaming at them, and they just ran headlong past in total and complete panic. The British landed, they conquered Manhattan, and Washington had to retreat to an area in the north, right by where the George Washington Bridge now is, called Fort Washington. Now it's called Washington Heights. And his army holed up there, and the British besieged it, uh, again with their navy in the Hudson River. Stupid move by Washington. He should have just left. But once again, he pulled one of these nighttime escapes under the cover of fog, rowing across the Hudson River, this time to New Jersey. Then Washington began a long retreat all the way down New Jersey, from the New York area all the way down to the southern part of the state which, where Trenton was. And on that retreat, things really fell apart. His army deserted. Uh, he'd started out with 20 or 30,000 men in Boston. Now he was down to four or 5,000, only one or two, 3,000 combat effectives. Um, no decent uniforms, no shoes, limited ammunition, limited muskets, no discipline, absolutely terrible. It looked like the whole thing was falling apart. Now in the meantime, there was an American general named Henry Lee, who a lot of people felt should have been the commander instead of Washington. He'd been a lieutenant colonel in the uh, British Army during the Seven Years' War, and uh, based on, actually I think a full colonel, and based on that he became a major general in the Polish Army. People moved, mercenaries moved around. Uh, now he enlisted in the American Army as a major general, co-equal with Washington, but with much, much more combat experience. In fact, Fort Lee, New Jersey was named after the fort that he built on the Jersey side of the shore, and Washington retreated there after Fort Washington across the river fell. When uh, with Washington retreating and everything falling apart, Henry Lee helpfully went down to Congress and started to lobby to get Washington thrown out and to get himself appointed as General of the Army. And he had a lot of support in the Congress, and it looked very much as if this might happen. So as we approached Christmas of 1776, there was a desperate situation. Uh, the army was half gone, was almost gone. Washington was discredited. Uh, France was pulling back its aid because it didn't think that revolution had a snowball's chance in hell. So what happened was that Washington realized, I've got to do something. If I don't do something, we're just gone. So he conceived this brilliant plan to attack on Christmas Eve across the Delaware River, despite the ice flows, and take on the Hessians, these are the mercenaries from the province of Hesse in Germany, that King George had hired to help him fight the war. And Hessians had a special uh, reputation in the U.S. as ruthless, barbaric soldiers, not British at all. And uh, colonial troops were scared to death of the Hessians. But Washington said, nope, we're going to take them by surprise, we're going to attack them. And on Christmas Eve, as soon as night fell, they crossed the Delaware River. There's that famous rendering of it. Washington really did cross with them on a raft, as it says, put, putting the ice flows out of the way, and landed on the other shore. And during the cover of night, moved up to the Hessian defenses. 
Uh, he actually missed the schedule by a few hours, but it was fine. They were plenty drunk from their Christmas Eve celebrations, and they weren't. They were lightly guarded. They weren't sentinels or sentries. They weren't expecting an attack, and they woke up, and two or three thousand Continental soldiers are rushing into their their, their encampment, killing them as they went. Uh, and with very little loss of American life, they captured thousands of Hessians and killed hundreds more. Washington then went on to another battle near Trenton with equally encouraging results. And then, <laughs> realizing his luck might be up, he crossed back over the Delaware River to Pennsylvania. Well, that raid, that victory, encouraged everybody. It changed the whole environment. Enlistments started coming in, soldiers started re-upping, and the Europeans, particularly the French, began to take the war seriously. Washington, in that daring raid, crossing the Delaware, it's one of the few times where the myths of history are really justified, single-handedly saved the independence of the United States of America. Thanks a lot for watching.